In the background, two kids are attempting to get an old arcade system to work called Wild Gunman. Not only does this game not match with the cabinet it's housed in, the game doesn't even exist. Hi, I'm Shane. We had a lot of fun in our last episode, taking a look at how they show off video games and movies, exploring what mock gaming is, and even discovering an insanely rare arcade cabinet that most people didn't notice. So let's see what else we can find in even more video game scenes from movies. Wild Hogs, 2007, directed by Walt Becker. Cal, it's me. Hey, Bill. Uh, you wanna shoot some hoops or something before I take my ride? No, thanks. Good. Hello? Cool, I'll ask right now. Hey, Mom, can I play ball with Stu and his dad? Of course you can. Cool, thanks. Billy, played by Dominic Janes, is playing Gran Turismo 4 on a PlayStation 2. Or is he? Well, what's the problem? If you look closely, when he drops his controller to take a phone call, the game keeps playing itself in the background. Whoops. I think it's pretty obvious they've pre-recorded this gameplay and are playing it back on set. This way, it's consistent for continuity and the actor has something to react to in the scene. Dominic is just button mashing, acting like he's racing on the autumn ring track level, when in reality, he isn't. In the last episode, we called this mock gaming. If you missed it, that's what we call any scene where an actor can be seen playing a video game, but they're not actually playing. Here, dude, I'll be right over, okay? All right, bye. Okay, this here is a pet peeve of mine. I call it a fake off. He just turns off the TV when he leaves, but doesn't turn off the console. So that means he's just left his console running. And because we can see he was supposedly mid-race and didn't pause, the game is still going on in the background. His car probably crashed directly into a wall. Look, I get it. Actually showing someone going through the entire process of saving their game, turning off the console, and then switching off the TV would probably take way too long. But I can still hate it, and I do. The Princess Bride. 1987, directed by Rob Reiner. Fred Savage is starring as, um, well, he doesn't really have a name, so we're just gonna call him Unnamed Kid. And he's playing a baseball game called Hardball by Accolade, released on the Commodore 64 in 1985. If I had to guess, I'd say we're looking at real hardware here. Even the controller he's using appears to be a real joystick that could work with the Commodore 64. Hi, honey. I'm well. When Betsy Brantley, who is playing the mom, walks into the bedroom, Fred stops playing the game and the game itself stops. He's most likely actually playing the game on set. So what's gonna happen here is grandpa is gonna read an entire book to his grandson front to back. Doesn't sound too bad. I'll try and stay awake. And we get another fake off. The TV goes off, but the system stays on. If you're like me, this scene always gets to you. I'm constantly thinking about the poor Commodore 64 running in the background during the entire run of the film as Grandpa reads through the whole story. In the last scene we saw with Wild Hogs, it really bugged me. But here, with a Commodore 64, it sort of makes sense. The reason to fake off a console in real life is simply because you want to preserve your place mid-game or avoid waiting for a really long boot-up sequence from your console. Starting up a game on a Commodore 64 wouldn't have been very fast. Anyone who's a fan of the system probably could tell you that. When unnamed kid turns off the monitor instead of the console, he guarantees a shorter wait time before getting back into the action after his grandpa leaves. Well, thank you very much. Very nice. Also, many games of that era didn't feature a way to save your progress mid-game, so he'd lose his ongoing baseball game if he didn't keep it running. So, just like the last episode with Mallrats, you keep the console turned on to keep your place. Here, a fake-off makes sense for this character, but not with the scene from Wild Hogs. A PS2 could have saved your progress and would have also started up much faster. About the only thing wrong with this scene that I can notice is that the sounds from the game appear to have been added during post-production. The real Commodore 64 version of Hardball doesn't sound like that. It sounds like this. See? Very different. I hate that. 
Office Space, 1999, directed by Mike Judge. Ah, uh, now are you going to go ahead and have those TPS reports for us this afternoon? No. So I guess we should probably go ahead and have a little talk, hmm? All right now, Lumberg, I'm, I'm kind of busy. In fact, look, I'm gonna have to ask you to go ahead and just come back another time. I got a meeting with the Bobs in a couple of minutes. I love this scene so much because it looks so simple, yet it's layered with levels of authenticity. On the monitor, we can see that Peter, played by Ron Livingston, is playing Tetris for Windows. This version of Tetris was originally included in the very first release of Microsoft Entertainment Pack. It was sold with taglines like, no more boring coffee breaks, specifically targeting office workers. So it's totally believable that you would have seen this played on actual office computers at the time. Just maybe not right in front of your boss, but for Peter's character, this completely tracks. Here's a computer geek fun fact. The first Microsoft Entertainment Pack was so influential that it changed a lot of things many would take for granted with future Windows releases. You know the iconic game Minesweeper? Well, that was originally included in this pack and not bundled with Windows. Later on, somebody decided that they wanted to make sure every person in the world that had access to an office computer wasn't doing their work and instead was playing Minesweeper. Thanks, Bill Gates. You might think this is mock gaming, but this looks to me like the actor is actually playing the game. Tetris for Windows could be controlled completely from just the arrow keys. But unfortunately, because he likely is playing a game for real, it's wreaking havoc on the scene's continuity. In the establishing shot, we can see that Peter has cleared a few lines. When the camera angle changes, the blocks are now in a completely different position. We switch to a full screen shot of the game being played, and the blocks again changed positions. Now Peter has only cleared one line. The actor was probably resetting the game every time they started a new take. And with Tetris, no two games, are ever the same. The inclusion of this game tells a lot about the character and makes the office environment far more believable. But not everything was flawless. Early on in Peter's apartment, he has a Nintendo 64 with a single controller connected to the fourth player input instead of the first. What's going on here, Peter? I gotta be honest, I've never seen anyone do that, ever. It just looks weird. Fortunately for Office Space, the scenes with Tetris are great, but sometimes a film's production pays so little attention, it's kind of embarrassing. Rumble in the Bronx, 1995, directed by Stanley Tong. Hi. You shoot a city hard. Bye. Bye. Cool. Bye. -bye. <laughs> Danny, this is for you. For me? Yes. Don't play with me in class. Okay. Okay, bye. In this scene, we see Jackie Chan's character, Kyung, give a Sega Game Gear to Danny, played by Morgan Lamb. We witness him play the system a little later on. So let's just watch this one for a while. Uh, why don't you ever answer me? Did you eat? Let me fix you something. See anything wrong? Anything at all? Hmm? There is no game inside that Game Gear. They handed this poor kid an empty game console and told him, pretend you're having fun. They could have at least tossed a copy of Columns or Sonic the Hedgehog in there or something. To cover this up, they inserted some random game sound effects over top of the scene while the actor was clearly playing nothing. As a gamer and a film buff, once I notice something like this, it really distracts me from the movie. It just feels so unrealistic and obvious. It's amazing that absolutely nobody on the set noticed this or attempted to fix it in any of the scenes where this system is shown off. I mean, it's a Game Gear. Somebody had to notice that the cartridge wasn't in the Game Gear. Super Bad, 2007, directed by Greg Matola. Man, don't you have any non-infant clothes? It'll be fine. Yeah, and why don't you just wear what you wore to school? No, I can't do that. I can't let Jules see me when I wore to school. It's completely unbecoming. When asked what this scene is about, you'd probably say Jonah Hill's character Seth trying to dress to impress for a party. And you'd be right. 
But that's not all that's going on here, because this is also a really bad mock gaming scene. In the background of this fashion conversation, Evan, played by Michael Sarah, is also playing a video game. But there are issues with this gameplay that jump out at me immediately. The first one is when Evan says, You know I have to kill these guys because you don't negotiate with terrorists. I can tell he's playing the getaway Black Monday on PlayStation 2. The game takes place in London, and the specific scene he's playing is early on in the game where you play as a police officer dealing with a group of car thieves, not terrorists. Also, how he's using this controller is so very, very wrong. If you look at his hands, you can see that he's holding onto the lower grips or handles of the PlayStation 2 controller with only his thumbs placed on the left and right thumbsticks and avoiding every face button and trigger on the rest of the controller. Believe it or not, you can actually play the game like that. The Getaway Black Monday uses the dual thumbsticks in the driving sections, but he's not driving in this scene. He's in a shootout. To convincingly look like he's playing for real, he would need to be pushing at least some of the buttons on the controller. God, these terrorists multiply like bunnies. Where did I leave the M16? M16? This game, at least during this scene, doesn't feature an M16, so he didn't leave it anywhere. It just isn't there. Between the constant mentions of non-existent terrorists, the random gun name drop, and Michael Sarah just seemingly lost during this entire gameplay scene, something is definitely off. I did a quick search and found what was labeled as a shooting script for Superbad, and the video game part of this scene is completely different. The script calls out Grand Theft Auto as the game being played with the character Evan commenting on looking for a dirt bike. It could have been almost any GTA game on PS2 after GTA 3, since that one didn't have dirt bikes. It looks to me like there were some very fast changes to the scene, and it's very possible the actor didn't have much time to prepare for a game he wasn't familiar with. I can't, that's fun. Why do they make that if you can't even win, then why, why am I playing? I'm sure the filmmakers didn't want this scene to turn out as gaming nonsense, but sometimes stuff just happens and you have to roll with it. Like not being able to show Grand Theft Auto. Likely for licensing reasons. Daryl, 1985, directed by Simon Winsor. Can I have a try? I'll have to teach you how to play. Hey, twerp, let him try. Joy says he's so smart. Let's see him prove it. I think I understand. Daryl, played by Barrett Oliver, isn't a child, but a robot, which makes him amazing at video games. He's playing flawlessly without losing control while his car just keeps going faster and faster. Basically, it's a computer being really good at computers. I think we can all understand that concept. They're playing pole position on what looks like an Atari 800XL, which was a personal computer released in 1983. My problem is that while Daryl is playing, the game speeds up insanely fast. Now sure, he's a robot, and I get that. He'll play at the top speed without error. But fantasy robot child or not, this would never happen. First of all, this version of pole position doesn't go that fast, no matter how well you played it. It's not just Daryl's car that's going fast, the entire game is being sped up. All the timers on the screen are moving way faster than they typically would when playing this game for real. This means all the gameplay is being sped up to give the illusion that Daryl is playing the game faster than anyone else on the planet. I think they realized the sped up timers were kind of giving away the illusion. So they quickly zoomed into the lower part of the screen to cut out all the score, speed, and time information at the very top. But sped up footage aside, the actual base gameplay is seemingly very impressive. Too bad that is also likely faked. As far as I'm aware, this score is impossible, and if it was real, would be a world record run for the game. So how did they do it? Well, we're likely seeing a modified version of the game designed to artificially inflate the high score. 
If you look at the footage close enough, you'll notice that the score instantly jumps up by thousands of points. And if you look at the lap number, it goes from lap five to lap eight. That's really impressive, considering there are only four laps in pole position. It's very likely the film production worked together with Atari to make this moment happen. The filmmakers probably didn't have anyone on staff who was ripping apart game cartridges and reprogramming them. This modified game and footage were probably made by Atari directly, since they'd have the expertise and know-how to do this. Unless Daryl is actually real and he reprogrammed the cartridge himself, but I'm gonna assume that he's not. So why would Atari want to do this? Well, it might have been something that they felt could have been a great advertisement for the Atari 800 XL system, and maybe even pole position. Imagine tempting a whole bunch of kids who watched this movie back in the 80s to try and beat a high score they'd never be able to top. That's pretty evil. Back to the Future 2, 1989, directed by Robert Zemeckis. This is a video game! I got it working! My dad taught me about these. It is Wild Gunman. I'm a crack shot at this. You mean you have to use your hands? That's like a baby's toy. Hmm. In this scene, Marty McFly, played by Michael J. Fox, enters an 80s-themed restaurant in the distant future world of... 2015. In the background, two kids, played by John Thornton and Elijah Wood in his first big screen film appearance, are attempting to get an old arcade system to work called Wild Gunman. For many, this scene is iconic in the film, but there's a lot to break down here. Not only does this game not match with the cabinet it's housed in, the game doesn't even exist. In the feature commentary for the movie, Bob Gale and Neil Canton confirm that this arcade game was made special for the movie. Based on the graphics, they're showing a Wild Gunman game that is trying to look like the release on the Nintendo Entertainment System. The gameplay footage, however, isn't from the original NES gameplay at all. The animations of the falling hats are far too smooth, with rotations that would not have been possible with the NES at that time period. From what I can tell, this seems to be animated by hand and is not a real-time game sequence. Comparing the real Wild Gunman side by side with the movie version, well, it's easy to see that they're not the same game. And what did they choose to house their fabricated arcade game in? Well, it seems they repurposed a Nintendo Versus system. These cabinets came out in 1984 and introduced American arcade goers to Nintendo titles before the release of the NES in 1985. But the Versus system never had a Wild Gunman variation. The only connection I can find between this cabinet and the game is that they're both Nintendo properties. The funny thing is that Nintendo did release Wild Gunman arcades in cabinets called Play Choice 10 systems. This release was based off the NES version. And for those of you that don't know, this version of Wild Gunman was also itself based off a much older version that used filmed actors. That version of the game was shown off in a movie called Gas, which I don't think many people actually watched, but it's a real movie. In the world of the films, they establish that Marty has played this Wild Gunman arcade game many times at his local 7-Eleven. You know, in his old life before time travel was a thing. But in reality, Marty would have barely been able to play this game. The Play Choice 10 systems weren't released until 1986, yet Marty's trip through time starts months before that in October of 1985. So they haven't even come out yet. Marty, you're not thinking fourth dimensionally. There is the home console game, but that doesn't work out either. The home release of Wild Gunman was sold in test markets in America on October 18, 1985, around the same time the NES was as well, just 10 days before these films begin and Marty first time travels. If Marty was fortunate enough to get his hands on a coveted NES, he would have only had a week and a half to practice. So really, Marty shouldn't be very familiar with this game at all. Why did the filmmakers go out of their way to manufacture a fake arcade cabinet with this specific game? Well, I suspected it was to set up Marty's shooting skills for the third film, which would take place in the Old West. Just tell me one thing, where'd you learn to shoot like that? 7-Eleven. 
They needed a simple arcade game with a Wild West theme that involved a light gun. So they cobbled together this fake setup for a quick scene to establish that Marty could be a quick draw gunslinger because he's awesome at video games. The best part of this scene is that so much attention is pulled towards the Wild Gunman cabinet that people rarely see the Pac-Man cabinet sitting on the other side of the room. It's only shown very briefly, but it has a sign on it saying, priceless artifact, do not touch. Pac-Man is considered to be one of the most popular and widely sold arcade machines ever. Even today, when the imagined future world of the movie is now well in the past, it's not impossible to find an original Pac-Man to buy. I'd personally have hung that priceless artifact sign on the one-of-a-kind fake Wild Gunman arcade they had in the scene, because that thing deserves it. Believe me, it makes perfect sense. From pre-recorded gameplay to building a totally unique arcade system, filmmakers sometimes go the extra mile to make their movies work. And others, not so much. With huge budgets and resources, it's impressive and really fun to see what these folks can do in major motion pictures.